Americans who are struggling in this economy or reject this bill and continue playing the same games that have become the hallmark of this do-nothing Congress. The fact is the American people don't mind for these games anymore. Stop the games. Pass this motion to instruct conferees. And I yield back the balance of Chairman my time. yields back. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to my colleague, Mr. Ryan, from Wisconsin. I think the gentleman from yielding recognized for two minutes. I enjoy uh, listening to revisionist history as it's practiced here on the floor of the House of Representatives. Our friends on the other side are saying that we haven't done our job, that we're not doing our work. Well, let's think about this for a second. It was the House Republicans that passed the full year extension last year of the payroll tax and the unemployment extension. It was the House Republicans that named the conferees to get this work done. Let's think about who is and who is not getting their job done. This year marks the second year in a row where the president has literally flouted the law and is delaying his budget. It's two years and the president hasn't brought the budget on time as according to law. Today, a thousand days since the other body, the United States Senate, bothered to even try to pass, let alone propose a budget. We acted responsibly. We acted in time. And more to the point, Mr. Speaker, if we're going to have a temporary tax holiday for payroll taxes, Let's never forget the fact that payroll taxes finance Social Security. This is why we insist on spending cuts to make sure that Social Security is intact, remains whole. Failure to cut spending to pay for this temporary tax holiday means complicity with raiding the Social Security Trust Fund, and we are not in favor of that. Jill Lady from California. Uh, could I ask, uh, please, how much time remains on each side? Jill Lady has 10 minutes remaining. Uh, uh, with that, may I just remind our, our colleagues that uh, uh, we went f uh, lurching from one crisis to another during the past year, first about our debt ceiling default crisis, then whether or not we could even continue the government, uh, and then uh, we uh, uh, w spent some time shutting down the FAA. So that's the reason behind this uh, motion to uh, instruct conferees in terms of getting on time. And now I'd like to uh, yield two minutes to our colleague from New York. Uh, Mr. Engel. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentlewoman for yielding to me, and I rise in strong support of her motion, and I urge my colleagues to do so as well. Uh, today's a day of bipartisanship. The president is speaking to us. We should really show it. We should really put our money uh, where our, our mouth is. It may be true, as the gentleman just said on the other side of the aisle, that um, the Republicans uh, passed a year of the payroll tax uh, break. Yeah, but they put poison pills in it. They put Keystone in it. They put Medicare restrictions in it. We want a clean bill. We, 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 want, a side. we want a year bill. But let it be a clean bill. Let it be a, a bill that is not mixed in with anything else, no poison pills. I challenge my friends on the other side of the aisle to do that. This is what we should be doing. The American people want it. There are still significant differences between the two parties on the specifics. Let's resolve them. Let's resolve them sooner rather than later. The American people are saying Congress is dysfunctional. Congress can't even agree on a bill with which everyone agrees. And this is a more uh, a reason why we should pass this and show that we should not be playing politics on something that's so vital to people's lives. We should not wait till the very last minute to reach an agreement. This motion simply instructs conferees to finish negotiations by February 17th. And by doing so, we'd avoid confusion and uncertainty that happened la last time when the Congress waited until the last minute for the last extension. We need these tax breaks for the middle class. We need the dock fix. We need unemployment benefits for those who have been hurt by the, most by the prolonged economic downturn. Let's not play politics with people on these issues. I urge the conferees to quickly reach an agreement that will not hurt the unemployed and will help continue our economic recovery. So again, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support this motion so that we don't take this debate to the last minute again make us look like fools and play games with people's lives. Let's pass this. Let's do it now. Let's not wait. Let's stop the political games. I yield back. Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just remind my good colleague on the other side of the aisle that we were here. The House Republicans were here December 22nd. December 26th, conferees weren't even named yet. I was here Thursday, Friday of New Year's working on the issue. We're ready to do the work. But there is one thing that we will not yield on, is that we have had demonstrated years in Washington, D.C., of fiscal irresponsibility. And until we came in this freshman class of November 2010, there was an attitude of, don't worry about how we're going to cover it. 
Don't worry about how we're going to pay for it. Well, that attitude's changed. And that's why I am proud to yield to a fellow freshman member from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, for two minutes. Gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my, my freshman colleague from New York. Um, I've been watching uh, this discussion, this debate going on, and, and I am um, once again amazed by the issue. I am in favor of, of this motion to instruct. In fact, I am so much in favor of it that I wish we weren't here talking about it right now. I wish we had finished the people's work in 2011. As my colleague has pointed out, we were here. This idea that somehow we don't work until the, up, up until the minute. Mr. Speaker, this is, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is nothing more than, than a dog and pony show. And as a conferee, I'm, I am anxious to begin the House and Senate level meetings and to learn about what policy pathway will get us to the year-long extension we are all seeking, what we voted for, what we passed in the House of Representatives. By partisan effort, mind you. I am waiting to see what the Senate has to say about this on this 1,000th day of them not even passing a budget. The Senate's willingness to produce a plan is critical to giving employers, workers, and those seeking to re-enter the workforce certainty they need. Again, I am ready to work on this issue. My colleagues are ready to work on this issue. We were ready to fix this problem in 2011 where it should have been left so that into 2012 we could provide certainty for the American people. So thank you. Again, I support this effort. And let's get to work. I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. Gentlelady from California. I just would, uh, before I yield uh, time, want to uh, congratulate the conferees for finally meeting today for the very first time uh, at least five weeks after they were appointed. So that's the point. And uh, I'm pleased now to yield two minutes to our colleague from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee. Gentlelady from Texas is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentlelady from California for the recognition and also for the leadership. I might say to my colleagues that whenever we come to the floor of the House to do the people's business, it is an important uh, effort. And this motion to reconstruct uh, or to instruct is truly um, the people's business. I want to applaud you for framing the urgency of answering the call of doing what we need to do with respect to 160 million Americans who need a payroll tax relief. Again, tax cuts for middle class and working Americans. Not a discriminatory treatment of only the top 1% uh, having to be able to sing the song, Oh Happy Day, but to allow those who get up every day, some working with their hands, some working with the genius of their mind, and being able to get tax relief from this Congress. I also know that the American people are looking for immediate relief as it relates to jobs. And I join with my colleague, Chairman Larson of the Democratic Caucus, about the American Jobs Act and the President's uh, initiative on putting teachers and firefighters, police and construction workers to work, creating jobs and cutting taxes to put in the American uh, people's pockets and as well to provide job training and extended unemployment incentives. But I do raise this question as we look to protect Medicare and, yes, to provide the doctor fix, which is so important to Houston with the large Texas Medical Center and the large population of seniors. I join with my colleagues to urgently move toward that. But may I make it very clear that unemployment and benefits are not a handout. It is not given to people who have not worked. It is given to blue-collar workers. It's given to white-collar workers. It's given to people who have worked and contributed to this economy. For my friends on the other side of the aisle, to suggest in the most insulting way to give drug tests and to suggest that people need a GED. I can assure you, people want to get a GED, but when you talk at the body politic of unemployed workers, 14 million people can't find jobs because there are no jobs to be found, and we are working to create jobs. And so the issue is uh, help us pass the American Jobs Act and help recognize that those who get unemployment benefits, Mr. Speaker, are Americans who have worked, who deserve this kind of insurance. I join in passing the uh, payroll tax uh, motion to instruct and the unemployment benefits. Let's do it now. I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. Gentleman from New York. I reserve.
Gentleman reserves. Gentlelady from California. I'm pleased to yield two minutes to our colleague from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. I, I, I agree with uh, Representative Capps that we shouldn't wait. Uh, we, we have to move quickly to eliminate any uncertainty that American families have in planning their budget or any uncertainty they may have as to whether or not they're going to get unemployment benefits. I mean, we in this Congress have certainty to much of our lives, especially with the fact that, you know, we get paid every month. But if you're out there and you're in a tight, really tight budget, or you're unemployed, or you're a senior trying to make sure you can get your doctor of choice, uh, this motion that Ms. Capps has is very important because we need to recognize that the middle class has been under enormous financial stress. With the wealth of the country accelerating upwards, middle class people have been looking for a break. Uh, if I'm right, uh, Ms. Capps, this uh, legislation will provide up to $1,000 uh, for the year for a, a middle class uh, family that would, uh, that would be a great break for, for many families. Uh, this, this middle class tax break is imperative. Unemployment benefits for those who have not been able, despite their best efforts, to find a place in the job market, absolutely essential. You know, there's 13 million people unemployed. There's a tremendous number of unemployed people in my own state in Ohio. They're looking to see, are we going to help them eliminate the uncertainty? That's why the CAPS Amendment is important, because we move forward quickly to show them we're there for you. And senior citizens, they want to make sure they can get their doctor of choice, and the doctors want to make sure they're going to be uh, paid uh, what's appropriate. So I rise to support this amendment. Let's remember the middle class taxpayers. Let's remember those who are unemployed. Let's remember seniors who want to see the doctor of their choice. Let's remember doctors who want to get paid a fair amount. And let's pass this CAPS amendment. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I continue to reserve, and I am prepared to close. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman, gentlelady from California. And I'm prepared to close, too. I believe the gentleman goes first. Thank you. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In closing, I, I would just like to say simply this, that we wholeheartedly agree with the general sentiment that has been brought to the House chamber today with the motion that's before this body, that we need to do our work in the conference. We cannot wait till the last minute. And we wholeheartedly join in that sentiment. And we have demonstrated that commitment by what we have already done. Our actions should speak louder than our words. The House Republicans were here December 22nd asking the Senate to come back to the table and do the people's work. And we're ready to do that work now. We need the Senate to come to the table in good faith, finalize this package on a long-term basis, bring certainty to our payroll tax rates, bring certainty to our providers, how they get paid under Medicare and take care of the unemployment extension situation. But we must go into this conference with our eyes wide open. We were sent to Washington in November 2010 because the American people recognized the fiscal crisis that is coming to our shores in America if we don't get our debt under control and the habit that creates it, the spending problem of Washington, D.C. corrected once and for all, then we will not have a future in America. And that is unacceptable to me as a father of two, as the father of three, Mr. Crowley on the other side of the aisle indicated. We are fighting, fighting for our children and our grandchildren who have yet to see the face of this earth. And so I join with my colleagues in sending the message that we will do the work Hard-working taxpayers in America deserve no less. The U.S. Senate should come to the table, find a solution to these issues, and we will wholeheartedly join hands on our side of the aisle when we do it in a responsible way that will take care of this situation in a long-term fashion, not a short-term Band-Aid like Washington, D.C., for so long has thought is good policy at the expense of hard-working taxpayers of America. With that, I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentlelady from California. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to my colleague from New York. Uh, being here in December, as you uh, mentioned a few times, uh, it was uh, December 22nd that Senator McConnell, actually several uh, senators, said uh, to us, get, don't just be here, but get to work. And again, I acknowledge that today the conferees are meeting for the first time. And so I yield myself the remainder of my time. And in closing, just want to make a few reminder re quick points. First, to remind our colleagues what is in this motion. It simply says that the conference should finish its work and report it back to the House by February 17. It doesn't speak to specific outcomes, just that we get our work done and do it in a timely fashion. It is very clear that we need to come together and work on the problems that the American people have sent us here to address. They are rightfully tired of the endless drama and the political posturing in Washington, D.C. They know we can do better, and we know it too. And second of all, we pretty much agree on the need for the basic provisions of this bill, extension of the payroll tax cut, a tax cut for middle-class, hardworking families, an extension of, pay, of unemployment benefits, and a doc fix for Medicare providers for the rest of the year. And third, it sounds like we all want to get these issues resolved as quickly as possible. And there was a, a lot of agreement here on the floor during the past hour. So I hope we can all agree now to pass this simple, and common sense motion to re instruct the conferees to get their work done over the next three weeks so that we can get our work done here on the floor and get moving to an agenda uh, that we know lies before us. I urge my colleagues to support this motion and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. The question is on the motion offered by the gentlelady from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. Can I ask, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the yeas and the nays? The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on the question will be postponed. Does the gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H. Res. 516, a resolution expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that the passage of a fiscal year 2013 federal budget is of national importance. Clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 516, resolution expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that the passage of a fiscal year 2013 federal budget is 
is of national importance. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Ryan, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend the remarks and include extraneous material in H. Res. 516 currently under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I'll yield myself three minutes at, that, at this time. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, we welcome the President to the House chamber tonight, where he will address the American people to assess the State of the Union. This presents another opportunity for the President to chart a new course. I hope the President takes this opportunity to stop offering empty rhetoric and broken promises, to stop pushing policies that have proven to make matters worse, and to stop dividing Americans for political gain. I hope the President takes this opportunity to start working with us to get America back on track. Yet, the administration has, time and again, turned hope into disappointment. The President and his party's leaders continue to duck from the most pressing fiscal and economic challenges facing our nation. Exhibit A is, of this failure is the fact that today marks 1,000 days without Senate Democrats passing a budget. Having failed to put forward a credible plan in 1,000 days, the President's party is committing America to a future of debt, doubt, and decline. Instead of dealing honestly with our biggest fiscal challenges and providing certainty to job creators, Senate Democrats have refused to meet their legal and moral obligations to propose and pass a budget. The President and his party's leaders refuse to account for their reckless spending spree. The lack of credible budget plans from the President and his party leaders raises the question, what are they hiding? Is it threats to economic security, health security, and national security that would result from their policy agenda? The job-destroying tax hikes that they continue to insist upon? The bureaucratic rationing and denial of vital care for seniors that would result from their health care law, or the deep cuts to the military that would hollow out our national defense. Mr. Speaker, their policy preferences call for ever higher levels of government spending, higher taxes, a board of bureaucrats to cut Medicare, and a smaller military. It's understandable why they'd be afraid to try and fit that agenda on a spreadsheet, but that is no excuse for giving up on budgeting. This failure to budget stands in stark contrast to our efforts here in the House. As the law requires, we proposed and passed a budget resolution last spring. We honestly confronted our nation's most difficult challenges, putting the budget on a path to balance and the country back onto a path to prosperity. We will keep working together to advance solutions this year and we call upon our friends in the Senate to get serious about their duty to those they serve. Propose a budget, engage in debate, advance solutions. I thank Congressman Nugent for his leadership on this resolution, which expresses the sense of the House that passage of the budget is of national importance. I yield myself 15 seconds to say we must recommit ourselves to the American idea. We must apply our nation's timeless principles to the challenges of the day, and we will continue to advance bipartisan solutions and the principal reforms necessary to get our country back on track. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Um, I uh, appreciate, as always, the opportunity to exchange views with my good friend from Wisconsin, uh, the chair of the Budget Committee, uh, with whom I've been pleased to work with on some items. Occasionally, rarely, we're opposed. But this is one of those areas where I, I do have some concerns. When I hear my friend talk about empty rhetoric and broken promises, uh, I am reminded of what the Republican agenda has been to this point in this Congress. Debt, doubt, and decline. Debt, doubt, and decline. Well, I think that that's a pretty good uh, assessment of what has been offered up 
by my good friends when they had an opportunity this last year to present their vision. Now they attempt to lay this off somehow on the Senate and we all have had our frustrations with the other body. But the fact is the problem that we face in terms of being able to work regular order is that there has been a decision by the minority leader in the other body, uh, the, the senior senator from Kentucky, uh, the Republican leader, has been very clear. His number one priority is not putting Americans back to work. It's not dealing with the challenges we face at home and abroad. It is to make sure that President Obama is not reelected. And when you start from that premise and radiate out, we have seen the Senate, which has never been, shall we say, nimble, uh, has slowed to a crawl. We have seen an unprecedented effort to make even the most modest and mundane efforts over there require a supermajority. It's unprecedented. It is sad. Um, the American people deserve better, but it is Republican obstruction that has twisted the rules of the Senate to make it non-functional. Debt, doubt, and decline. The Republican budget, notwithstanding all the pyrotechnics and the effort to spread doubt about whether or not the United States would honor its commitment paying the national debt for debt that is already incurred, which occupied too much time this summer, an absolutely manufactured crisis, um, the Republican budget, authored by my good friend from Wisconsin, itself would have required increasing the debt ceiling. And when you talk about decline, my Republican friends have failed to move forward with meaningful job creation. We've had languishing a reauthorization for the Surface Transportation Act, which we've had to extend eight times. And in fact, the Republican budget actions to this date are cutting back on investment in water, in transportation, things that would put Americans to work all across America. And as for bureaucratic rationing of health care, um, I'm surprised my good friend can say that with a straight face because remember his budget takes the half trillion dollars and accepts it. He doesn't unwind it. He doesn't change it. He accepts it. They count on it because they know that in fact there are opportunities for us to strengthen Medicare without ending the guarantee that two generations of senior citizens have relied upon to be able to have the Medicare payments when they need it, um, we have the opportunity to refine and reform Medicare to provide better service for our seniors and eliminate unnecessary expenditures. There was a time when those agenda items, not the rhetoric, not uh, vouchering this and slashing that, but what was required to move forward to actually reform Medicare, that's been bipartisan. It's been agreed to. It's being practiced by healthcare systems in Wisconsin, in Oregon. Um, we know what to do. We have the opportunity to do it. Um, unfortunately, the Republican approach to this point has been to assume that it's too expensive that we, that we can't do, it's too expensive for the federal government, so we're going to transfer the risk to the next generation of senior citizens. Um, but taking the savings under the Affordable Care Act. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, we're going through an exercise today that is largely beside the point. What we should be doing is dealing with pieces of legislation that would have bipartisan support moving forward, accelerating health care reform, rebuilding and renewing America, taking things like the work that I've done with my good friend from Wisconsin in terms of reforming the agricultural system that wastes too much money on the wrong people doing the wrong things. We could be moving forward 
on a constructive agenda that the Occupy Wall Street people and the Tea Party folks could actually get behind. Um, unfortunately, today, this um, H. Res 516 is another sidetrack that gets us away from doing what we should do. Uh, I'm going to reserve the balance of my time. Served. Gentleman from Wisconsin. Hey, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I yield time to the gentleman from Texas, I'll simply say I'm, I'm sure my, my colleague, my friend from Oregon, um, knows that you cannot filibuster a budget resolution in the Senate, and I'll just state that for the record. I'm sure he, he realizes that. At this time, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, a uh, member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Flores. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just like America's families and businesses, Congress must base its spending on a budget so that the federal government lives within its means. While Americans struggling in the Obama economy must sit down every day and produce a budget for their families, Senate Democrats have decided it would be a better political move to not produce a budget for the nation, even though the law requires passage of an annual budget. To repeat, the Senate leadership is ignoring the law and has been for 1,000 days. A budget plan is Congress' most basic responsibility of governing. But without a budget, the State of the Union is uncertain, just like the economy is today. Coincidentally, today is not only the President's State of the Union, it is also the 1,000th day since the Senate last passed a budget. And without surprise, yesterday, just like it did last year, we also learned that the White House will again miss its deadline to submit a budget to Congress. For 1,000 days, the Democrat-led do-nothing Senate has refused to fulfill this duty to the American people. During this time, our national debt has surpassed our gross domestic, gross domestic, gross domestic product, and we've seen 35 straight months of unemployment higher than 8 percent. That means trillions of dollars of debt are being added to the bill our children and grandchildren will be forced to pay. House Republicans put together a plan to put America back on sound fiscal trajectory and to avoid a future of doubt, debt, and despair. Our path to prosperity budget will cut excess spending while strengthening vital programs like Medicare so they will be around for current and future generation. Unfortunately, Senate Democrats rejected this bill and they, in fact, they have not bothered to do their job and pass a budget for the federal government since April 29th, 2009, exactly 1,000 days ago. Today, I call on President Obama and Senate Democrats to do their jobs, providing real leadership for the American people, and to join House Republicans in passing a responsible budget so that we may re restore America's promise, prosperity, and, pro and security for future generations. I urge my colleagues to support this impo important resolution H.R.S. 516. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Oregon. Reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Wisconsin. At this time, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Speaker, I'll yield two minutes to Mr. Scott from Georgia. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I heard the uh, gentleman from Oregon speaking of debt, doubt, despair, decline, I couldn't help but think that all of those words start with D, just as Democrat does, and recovery starts with R just as a Republican does. Now, Mr. Speaker, the President presented a budget, and that's a fact. And the House passed a fiscally responsible budget. The Senate defeated both of those budgets and then failed to produce an alternate. Mr. Speaker, Republicans in the House stand willing to work and want to move to regular process. Senator Reid has closed that door at every opportunity. Today, we call on the President to appeal to the Senate in a State of the Union address tonight to ask the Senate simply to pass a budget. Without a budget, there is no plan. With no plan, that means no recovery, and no recovery means no new jobs. Now, Mr. Speaker, Americans did not send us here to play the same tired old games that Senator Reid continues to play. They sent us here to get something done for this generation. This is my son, Wells. He's 12 years old. Our class represents over 300 children and grandchildren. Now, times are tough, but Americans are tougher, and so the future of America is bright. But today, 1,000 days that this country has operated without a federal budget. Now, I understand the majority leader likes to say that we don't have a budget because of House freshmen, but that's simply not true. When we arrived in Washington, we were sworn in just over a year ago, and America had operated at that time without a budget for 678 days. Our fresh, freshman class knew we could do better than that, and we did better than that, Mr. Speaker. 
we passed a budget in the House, and we call on the President tonight to ask the Senate to fulfill their job for the American people and simply pass a budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the majority of my time, the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Oregon. Reserves. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long. The gentleman Thank from you. Missouri is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to address a thousand days. Now, I could try and impress you with my knowledge of a thousand days and tell you things like Mark Zuckerberg could have invented Facebook in his dorm room at Harvard 71.3 times in a thousand days, but I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. I could tell you that it'd take, you could build 2.4 Empire State buildings in a thousand days, but that really doesn't mean anything. Those are the things you could do in a thousand days. What I'd like to address is what you cannot do in a thousand days. What can we not do in a thousand days? The Senate cannot pass a budget. I was one of the 87 freshmen that got here last year. I've been here 365 plus days, so what happened to that first 600 and some days if we could address that when the Democrats controlled all three bodies, the House, the Senate, and the White House? They didn't produce a budget in that time. This is an election year. I don't think we're really going to see a budget this year. We can talk about it all we want and ask them to produce one, but it's not politically correct to budget in this country anymore. And to me, Mr. Speaker, that's appalling. When you do come forth with a budget, as we did last year, a couple days later you're going to get an ad of somebody throwing a lady off a cliff in a wheelchair, because that's what happens in this country when you put your plan down in writing. And that's appalling. Eighty-seven freshmen came here last year, doctors, nurses. I was one of two auctioneers, pizza parlor owner, roofing contractor, just like the Founding Fathers envisioned, car dealers, people off the street, people that have run businesses, small business people. We got here and we were told the first vote we needed to take was for what? Speaker of the House. We voted for John Boehner, Speaker of the House, because the public sent us up here with a 25-seat majority. What was our second vote? A CR, a continuing resolution. We looked at each other, continuing resolution. Oh, yeah, we've got to keep the government open for two more full weeks, 14 days, because that's how we operate here in Washington, D.C. And if that's not appalling, too, we, we were sent here to change the way Washington does business. Now, you can have your three Ds, doubt, despair, decline, and I think on hee-haw they used to say in agony, but, uh, you know, we can also be optimistic in this country. We, we can uh, be optimistic in this country. You can deal from a position of defeat and doubt and decline, like our colleagues across the aisle like to, but I, I wish I would have stepped 14 steps down the hall to my good friend from Oregon's office. That's how far our offices are apart, and I could have studied on how the first term of George W. Bush, they worked night and day how to figure out to get him reelected, because apparently Mitch McConnell's doing something wrong in the Senate, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Oregon. I would yield two minutes uh, to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman from Oregon. Uh, on its surface, the res resolution seems to make sense about uh, making sure we pass a <clears throat> budget and that's of national uh, importance. Uh, I think that all of us who are here understand the underlying politics that have made it very difficult to bring a budget forward. And of course, budgets are all about priorities. What are our nation's priorities? Um, when we get to the point of passing a budget, here's what we ought to be telling the American people. That the middle class will be protected. That the social safety net will be protected. That social security will be protected that benefits will not be cut, that the cap will be lifted, that there will be no privatization, that Medicare will be protected, that there will be a fix so that doctors can get a fair uh, uh, shake, and that we'll do something about Medicare Part D, which blew a hole in the Medicare budget, that we'll begin to cut back our military presence around the world, and that we start to take down this uh, military-industrial complex that General Eisenhower warned about so many years ago that we'll begin investing in new technologies so that we can grow the economy of the future. Budgets are about priorities. And while we still debate whether or not uh, we're going to pass a budget, we need to set those priorities that will enable America, when it finally has a budget, to move forward into the future with a country that's going to be serving everyone, not just a few at the expense of the many. I yield back. 
Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Wisconsin. Mr. Speaker, may I inquire as to how much time uh, remains between the two sides? Gentleman has ten and one half minutes remaining, uh, and uh, the side in opposition has twelve and one half minutes remaining. I reserve. Gentleman from Wisconsin, reserve. Gentleman from Oregon. Uh, I would recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, distinguished member of both the Budget and Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Doggett, for four minutes. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. I thank the gentleman. Uh, as a longtime member of the Budget Committee, I certainly think that having a budget resolution is a good idea. I think it is a matter of national importance. I don't see how anyone can really disagree with the resolution. Uh, though it seems to have been offered primarily to establish a setting uh, for the Republican response to the State of the Union address that we all look forward to hearing tonight. Uh, it is important to understand what the budget resolution is and what it is not and what difference it really makes if one hasn't been passed for a thousand days, uh, three or four years, or three or four weeks. The budget resolution is not the Appropriations Act. Uh, it is a statement of our values and of our priorities, and I think that it is important to uh, try to get one passed every year. But the most important practical consequence of passing a budget resolution uh, is to establish the level of discretionary spending. That is, to establish the uh, level of expenditures that can be made by the various Appropriations Committee and by this Congress. It provides us a good opportunity to look at what the consequences of that spending are, to try to match it up to revenues, uh, and not to engage in endless deficit spending. But the practical effect of the resolution itself is to say to the Appropriations Committee here in the House and in the Senate, uh, how much discretionary spending will the Congress approve this year? So what happens when there is not a budget resolution? The Congress finds other ways to do the very same thing. So, in fact, the Congress did not pass a budget resolution for fiscal year 2003, for fiscal year 2005, for fiscal year 2007. Uh, but that did not stop President Bush from signing appropriation bills that added billions of dollars to our national debt, along with uh, his uh, tax cuts for those at the top that also added immensely to our national debt. He signed those appropriation bills. I don't know whether we went a thousand days or a year or two then without a budget resolution. It would have been better if we could have adopted one. But it's this, the budget resolution tends to be confused by some people with the appropriations that keep the federal government going. This is not the act that Republicans from time to time have threatened to shut down the government. Would, you can't threaten to shut down the government over the passage of a budget resolution. That has happened with some of our appropriation bills. It almost happened with the ceiling on debt for the federal government. It is also inaccurate, not, not only confusing to mix the two, but it is inaccurate to say uh, that this Congress has not acted to establish some discretionary spending limits, even though a budget resolution, as good as it would be to have one, has not been formally adopted. We did, in fact, adopt last year the Budget Control Act. The Budget Control Act proposes to set discretionary expenditure limits of what this Congress will spend, not just for this year, but for a 10-year period in an effort to try to get spending under control and bring us closer uh, to uh, getting our fiscal house in order, which is something we very much need to do. Uh, I see today's resolution as restating the obvious, that a budget resolution is a good idea, uh, but uh, not uh, adding really much to uh, our attempt to achieve some balance in our budget. Indeed, uh, the last uh, debate here on the floor about instructing conferees and trying to move forward uh, on the issues of uh, unemployment, job creation, and the payroll uh, tax extension, uh, much more uh, on target than a resolution of this nature. We do have some serious challenges and deadlines. We still have uh, almost 5 million Americans that would lose their unemployment benefits this year if we don't have an extension. I'd focus on those uh, and uh, working with the President rather than a resolution that accomplishes little. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at this time I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Nunnally. 
gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the gentleman from Wisconsin for yielding and also for your leadership on budget issues. 1,000 days without a budget. And then two days ago, we received news that the president is going to miss his deadline for submitting a budget to Congress. Rather than urging Senate Democrats to pass a budget and work with us to solve our nation's fiscal problems, President Obama has joined them in failing to do their job. America deserves better than this. Families and businesses set budgets every day. How much money do we have? What can we afford? What do we have to go without? In Washington, we have an obligation to ask and to answer those same questions. As I learned operating a small business, failing to plan is planning to fail. Now, 17 years ago, when I lost my job in a corporate merger, my wife and I sat down around a kitchen table, made a pot of coffee, and got out a sheet of notebook paper. Drew a line down the middle, and on the left side, we wrote, this is how much we have. On the right side, how are we going to spend it? That's a budget. Americans are sitting around their kitchen tables every night, and they have every reason to expect their government in Washington to do the same thing. In the House, we passed a serious budget last year, and we're committed to do so again this year. It's time for the President and the Democrats in the Senate to do the same. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's interesting. I will yield myself uh, two additional minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. It's interesting to watch my friends attempt to reframe the issue away from proposals that they have offered and the inartful uh, budgetary uh, fiscal activities of this last year. It was, after all, a Republican choice to halt the operation of the other body, uh, essentially shutting down the Senate by uh, requiring supermajorities on everything. We started the year with a threat of government shutdown. You recall we went just two uh, minutes away from having to shut down the federal government uh, over uh, a uh, basically theological argument on the, on the part of my uh, friends on the other side of the aisle over things like Planned Parenthood and Big Bird. Then this summer, we had cast doubt for the first time uh, in history about whether or not we were actually going to honor the requirement to pay the, the, the debt for obligations we'd already incurred. This summer, um, the uh, Republicans were willing to leave town, and we actually shot the hostage when it came to the FAA. 70,000 people uh, were idled uh, on construction projects for aviation, 4,000 employees laid off. And then this fall and into the winter, we had the, the spectacle of what should be a relatively routine effort and has been a routine effort for Republicans and Democrats alike dealing with things like the extension of unemployment insurance and avoiding a draconian impact with the sustainable growth rate, the SGR, the doc fix. And we watched our Republican friends in the House and the Senate unable to communicate um, and we ended up having uh, a situation uh, where uh, we were going to, uh, where they just basically turned their back on the American people and we're, uh, we're going to insist it was their way or the highway again. I'll give myself one additional minute. Can I ask Thank one you. additional minute? And it took days uh, for finally reason to settle in when even the Republicans in the Senate had to say, no, well, this is kind of a deal that we had. Um, and even though there appears to be uh, a lack of accord a on, on behalf of uh, the new majority in the House, uh, we're spinning around. And all the time we're dealing with things like this that are a sideshow when the majority of, the bu of what really makes the difference, how we spend the money, 
These appropriations bills, the majority of which haven't even come out of the Republican-controlled committee to the Republican-controlled House to be passed when we actually should be working on the next fiscal year. So uh, we'll endure the sideshow. This will pass. It will not really do anything other than sort of the, try and be the pivot point and trying to spin the issue. Uh, but it would be nice at some point to stop the spin and the things that are beside the point and maybe encourage the Republicans to agree amongst themselves, come into accord between the House and the Senate, and maybe get some of these appropriation bills to the floor so we can see where we're going. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time is reserved. Gentleman from Wisconsin. This time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Hillscamp. Gentleman from Kansas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I rise in support of the resolution offered by my colleague, the gentleman from Florida. The jaws of the people I represent drop when I inform them that 1,000 days have passed since the Senate actually passed a budget. 1,000 days since Democrat Harry Reid allowed a budget to actually be debated. They can't believe that such a failure of duty has occurred, let alone that it can occur. Two weeks ago, I hosted a town hall in Clay Center, Kansas, and a constituent asked, how is it possible for the Senate to not pass the budget? As the constituent correctly pointed out, you can't run a city, state, or a business this way. Washington seems to be the only place in the world where reality doesn't apply. Perhaps it's fitting the president traveled to the most magical place on earth, Disney World. Last week, he is complicit with allowing the Senate Democrats to live out a fairy tale in which fiscal policy is carried out on a whim. Not only do cities, states, and businesses not function without budgets, but American families cannot get ahead without them. Families who face mountains of debt, like Washington does, never erase the red ink without a plan to pay, pay it down or a plan to stop adding to it. Families who want to save and invest for the future cannot do so without a budget. Families who want to leave a legacy for their children and grandchildren come up with a blueprint to do so. In the same regard, we should be focused on the legacy Washington is leaving for our children and grandchildren, Mr. President. And Mr. Reed, we cannot wait. wait. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Oregon continues to reserve. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, I'll speak for a minute and a half, then we have one final speaker, so then I'll yield back to the gentleman. Okay. I yield myself a minute and a half, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized. Here's the deal, Mr. Speaker. We're going to have a debt crisis in this country if you don't watch it. And what's going to happen if that happens is everybody's going to get hurt in this country. Europe is in the middle of austerity. What that means is they're cranking up taxes on all their countrymen, slowing down their economy, and they're pulling the rug out from under their seniors who've already retired and organized their lives around these programs. We want to prevent that from happening. We want to preempt a debt crisis. We want to get America on a path to prosperity and deal with this debt issue. And we can't grow the economy and create jobs unless we do that. And the only way to fix this problem, to prevent seniors from getting harmed, to grow this economy, is to have a budget. And it's been a thousand days since the Senate bothered even trying to pass a budget. It's the epitome of irresponsibility that the other body has neglected this most basic function of governing. We've got to save this country. In order to do that, we have to budget and prioritize because that's what our constituents elected us to do. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Oregon. Reserves. The gentleman reserves. No, no, no. You take the rest of it. Oh, that's, that's included. Oh, yeah. I see. I'm, I'm sorry. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Thank you. I uh, yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Um, I ag agree with the goal of my good friend from Wisconsin uh, about making sure that we uh, deal with our long-term problems of budget deficits and national debt and certainly look forward to working together, moving down a path to prosperity. Uh, 
but we have slightly different ways of going about this. Uh, and it's unfortunate because I think if we really had full and open debate on the floor of the House, if we hadn't accepted draconian rules that make it very hard to be able to discuss on the floor the opportunity to have a balanced approach that would include, for example, eliminating unnecessary tax breaks for uh, industries that no longer need them, uh, or adjusting uh, the tax code so we wouldn't have the anomaly of where uh, people worth hundreds of millions of dollars, the most recent example of uh, Mr. Romney releasing his tax returns uh, where he's paying less than 15 percent uh, due to the use of carried interest long after he left um, his former employer, um, these are things that we could do that the American public agrees with and that would help have a balanced approach that ultimately we will do that would make a difference. I am, as I mentioned, um, a little bit perplexed that we're going to uh, continue to uh, beat up on the Senate, although that's always fun to whack around the other body, but the point is that the dysfunction of the Senate is a Republican choice to shut it down, require extraordinary majorities for the most routine of items. We see it with judicial appointments that have been cleared out of committee, that have bipartisan support, that the minority in the other body, the Republican Party, won't even allow to move forward when we have a serious crisis in a number of uh, the areas of our judiciary. We have watched where there's long on rhetoric, but when it comes time to just getting the budgets done for this year, there are six major appropriations bills for this year, and we're now five months in to the fiscal year, that are languishing, that have not passed um, through the, out of the Republican committee to the Republican-controlled House to at least start the process going. Now, today in the Budget Committee, we had uh, a fascinating intellectual exercise. There were four bills that were uh, considered. Uh, we're moving these items to the House floor, uh, each and every one of which was an interesting intellectual exercise but in the name of uh, transparency and simplicity and giving the American public a fuller picture, every one of them clouds the budget picture, whether it's dynamic scoring, that, uh, the so-called that won't uh, deal with important investments like infrastructure and talk, give the people a great picture, but it will muddy the waters in terms of the impact on legislation coming forward biennial budgets when we can't even get, uh, we can't move forward now with appropriations on an annual basis, we'll institutionalize the slide, the sideshow, we'll do it twice, we'll require the bureaucracy to generate more information over a longer time frame that will be more inaccurate. You know, it flies in the face of what's happening in the states which have been referred to as the laboratories of democracy, that most of whom used to have biennial budgets, uh, and the majority are moving away because it doesn't work, it's inaccurate, it, it requires extra work. This is part of the Republican approach, is to move in this direction. Uh, freezing baseline budgets will make long-term budgeting less accurate uh, and make it harder to really assess what the budgetary costs and consequences were going to be. And then there's a little thing uh, that deals with risk adjustment that would require the current process which, where there is an, an absolute accurate appraisal of what will happen with federal loans and their performance, but because it doesn't deal with their academic model, will require a, a risk adjustment premium uh, and further budget balancing. Uh, and I defy any member of the House to explain to any of their constituents, even pretty sophisticated people, why this is an improvement for greater transparency and accuracy. The point is it's continuing a sideshow. Instead of working together, 
on what the American public wants. They want a balanced solution. And if we didn't have the vast majority of people in the House and the Senate pledging their fealty to an unelected lobbyist um, uh, on uh, pledging never to increase taxes, um, we could have moved with the uh, super committee and moved forward and done something. Uh, it's time for us to start, stop the gimmicks, maybe work together doing what the American public wants so that we can deal with avoiding a debt crisis and get us launched on a path to, pass, path to prosperity that the American public would agree with.